للكافرين والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين والذين اذا فعلوا فاحشه والذين اذا فعلوا فاحشه او ظلموا انفسهم ذكروا الله فاستغفروا لذنوبهم ومن يغفر الذنوب إلا الله ولم يسروا على ما فعلوا وهم يعلمون أولئك جزاؤهم مغفرة من ربهم وجنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها I think let's stop here. It will be difficult to finish all these verses in one day. <coughs> Let me read first the translation. يا ايها الذين امنوا لا تاكلوا الربا اضعافا مضاعفه واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون او ye who believe devour not interest involving multiple additions and fear allah that you may prosper and fear the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers and obey Allah and the Messenger that you may be shown mercy and hasten towards forgiveness and hasten towards forgiveness from our Lord, from your Lord and the paradise whose value is the heavens and the earth it is prepared for the God-fearing the word value can be also replaced by the word expense in fact uh, the word expense is closer to the meaning of the word ard than value that should be preferred value of course is included in that so i'll reread the translation and hasten towards forgiveness from your lord and the pro- and the paradise you should hasten both to the forgiveness from your Lord and to the paradise, which uh, in fact represent the same thing. And hasten towards forgiveness from your Lord and the paradise, whose expanse is the heavens and the earth. It is prepared for the God-fearing. Those who spend in... Uh, Prosperity has those who spend in prosperity. I am sorry, that's quite right. Looking back at the Arabic text now, I know why it why it why it has been translated. So, those who spend in prosperity and adversity, and those who suppress anger and pardon men, 
and Allah loves those who do good. Now this verse should be read in conjunction with the previous one. Otherwise, there seems to be some answer missing. This is the description of further, further description of those who uh, deserve Allah's forgiveness. They are such people, that is, those who spend in prosperity and adversity, and those who suppress anger and pardon men, and Allah loves those who do good. And those who, when they commit a foul deed or wrong themselves, remember Allah and implore forgiveness for their sins, and who can forgive sins, who can forgive sins except Allah? And do not knowingly persist in what they do. And who can forgive sins except Allah is in parenthesis. And the sentence reads on. And do not knowing, uh, do not knowingly persist in what they do. It is those whose reward is forgiveness from their Lord and gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they shall abide, and excellent is the reward of good workers. The first verse deals with the question of uh, uh, usury. The question would be raised as to why suddenly there is a total uh, shift from the discussion of one subject to another apparently unrelated subject. But we'll come to that later and discuss. Because if you remember, and let me repeat the verse which, uh, with which we ended yesterday, In fact, the, all the verses which we have discussed already in the preceding Ruku deal with the situation of Ohad and uh, what passed there and uh, the reasons why and uh, the Muslims behaved in a manner and so on and so forth. So suddenly, there seems to be a completely different subject being discussed here, which is usury. But the first Ruku also ended up with something in between the two which could be a link from one subject to another that is walillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi ard yaghfiru liman yasha wa yu'adhibu man yasha wallahu ghafurur rahim and to allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth he forgives whomsoever he pleases and punishes whomsoever he pleases and allah is most forgiving merciful but as I have uh, already told you, inshallah, we'll come to the relationship question later on. But let me discuss first some important words and what, what other commentators have uh, said about the difficult points of this verse. First of all, the word riba. This has been translated as usury or interest. What is riba? What is the root of the word riba? Raba yarbu, which means something which increases, which grows. So, raba yarbul malo, that is, the wealth grows. And if you say arba, which this would mean that you have increased something something else. The, the one is uh, intransitive. The first was the intransitive form and the second is the transitive form. From Raba Yarbu, the transitive verb would be Arba. Arriba al faidato any profit or excess of what you have spent would be uh, which you you get get in return would be called riba also the word arabwa is is uh, uh, 
considered to be the the the, the, the derivative I mean, uh, the the this the, the root verb root root uh, uh, what was the word which i proper grammatical term i've forgotten the root word from which the word riba is derived is also described to be a rabwa which apparently has no direct connection but in meaning of course it has some connection a rabwa is a plateau a raised uh, place anywhere that is called a rabwa so because the meaning is common to increase to grow so any place which is high and tall is uh, also derived from the same intransitive verb uh, now the same uh, uh, root word re be wow these are the three roots of the words of the word again one other meaning is very interesting which is generally not known to the people rabwa is our our, our center central town in pakistan so we know rabwa is a, an elevated place but we don't know that rabwa also means a community and a well knit community for that matter so in uh, al munjad lisan mujum al wasit this has also been mentioned that ar rabwa means a large important strong community al arzul murtafa i have already explained ar rabwa also means dhiqun nafs that is asma or shortness of breath what relationship it has with the meaning of elevation or anything in fact when you go to higher altitudes you are always in danger of losing your breath and shortness of breath is related to high altitudes so that is why in arabic apparently different meanings belonging to a single word have really deeply connected with each other in final analysis you can always find some definite link in the meanings of these words which apparently are different raba is also used uh, in the sense of rabba from rububiyat you say rabbahu which means you brought something up looked after it and uh, made it grow under your benign uh, um, patronage but also raba has the same meaning because raba is connected with something which is lifted which is raised in status and things so what does it mean here in connection with this verse this is the question it is believed that uh, money increases with the passage of time it should increase otherwise there would be no usury no interest so this concept related to the money has given birth to the institutions of usury if you part with your money which may have been lying idle with you without giving birth to other uh, monetary children still when you pass it on to somebody else for usage you uh, give it on the consideration that money should grow that is why once ahadr sallallahu alaihi wasallam in response to somebody why usury was forbidden Uh, instead of answering the question he made a counter question he said does your money give children give birth to children so that was the point which he was referring to the central point is money by itself has no power to grow but because there is a false notion attached to to money that it should grow 
So whenever people passed on money for usage to others, they, under this false conception, they thought that they should get more increase. So the Holy Quran rejects this idea. The Holy Quran, in fact, uh, proposes a completely different concept about money. It, the Holy Quran says that if you employ money to exploit poor people, then money has the quality of decreasing in value rather than increasing. And it's a very uh, deep economic, there, there is a very deep economic wisdom in this, which I have discussed elsewhere, but uh, I don't think this is there is time for me to enlarge upon this anymore. But remember that Quranic concept is completely opposite to the generally known and accepted economic concepts about the quality of money or the capital as you may call it. Capital in Islam is an inert thing basically. Wedded to human values, it has possibilities both to grow or to lessen and decrease. It would, the resultant would depend only on the person who is employing money and using it to his advantage or disadvantage. So money is an inert value which is neither plus nor minus. Only when it is wedded to human values, then it could either produce and be, grow more or uh, lose and become less. So riba is something, uh, a name, Arabic name, which is uh, related to growth, but the Holy Quran does not accept it. In another place, it makes it very clear that this notion is not acceptable. But anyway, the name is such. Adafa mudafa is the other word. Adafa means to double up, to multiply, to grow rapidly. But mostly it means doubling and redoubling, of course. So, although there is uh, a paradoxical connotation in the word dwad and fe, from used, uh, the, this, this is the root word, because dawfa means to weaken. He weakened and grew old. Like Chima Sahib has grown old, but he has not weakened. So he's a good example of this paradox. Dawfa, but becoming stronger instead of growing weak. So Dawfa Shao, something which, uh, uh, you know, became loose and enfeebled and like the grow old people's flesh is loosened, you know, it lacks and it doesn't have that strong strength left in it as it had in the youth. But at the same time, when you use the word in with different inflection, it has the, exactly the opposite meaning. To put something, pile something up on another thing, layer upon layer, so and bind it together so that it doubles up. What they fushay means something which is uh, increased by multiplication by doubling. Adof is the plural of the word of, of daif. So this means uh, do not eat. The translation would be do not eat uh, interest or uyari, uh, which goes on doubling and increasing in, in mass and volume and uh, has the unlimited possibility of growth. So Adafa mudafa means not only doubling up, but a continuous process of doubling it, endless process of doubling up, which has no limit.
وَتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِهُونَ and fear Allah the word taqwa is already well known to the Muslims in general and Ahmadis in particular so I don't have to further explain it here Imam Razi has uh, as far as the relationship with the previous verse is concerned Hazrat Imam Razi, Razi uh, has quoted Tafsir Fatul Qadir uh, Imam Razi as well as Tafsir Fatul Qadir and Shawkani declare in one place that this is a completely new subject taken up by the Quran it has no relationship with what has passed but at another place Imam Radi has a different view to present he says of course it has a connection with the previous verses and here Qafal is quoted Qafal is one of the one of the very astute commentators of the Holy Quran that I have read he comes out with the most beautiful uh, an ingenious idea which has proved to be absolutely correct in the history of modern warfare he says it has a very genuine deep connect cont connection with what has passed before because the uh, idolaters before going into wars used to employ their money uh, uh, for collecting you, uh, interest on the on the loans, and it was mainly the interest which was used to feed the war requirements. So he says, connect system of usury and interest is uh, always connected with warfare. So because uh, the idolaters had done that and uh, apparently they had borne all the costs of coming all the way from Mecca with such pomp and power and such number and force so this may have given the false idea to the Muslims that if they want ever to retaliate they should follow their example and do the same thing so that is why a timely reminder is given to them that don't ever contemplate uh, exploiting the poor with uh, you, uh, by, by lending money to them uh, or for the sake of interest even in good cause <clears throat> even for jihad you are not permitted so this is a very sensible connection of which we will speak again most of the commentators have gone about uh, describing the nature of uh, uh, the crime if a Muslim commits this crime of uh, indulging in uh, interest uh, either giving or taking some scholars have gone so far as to declare it as kufr and they say any Muslim who uh, indulges in any uh, financial dealings uh, which are based on usury terms etc or interest he should be considered pakka kafir and he has nothing to do with Islam some others have taken it more slightly lightly but consider it to be among the major sins now the dis subject of discussion now the emphasis uh, uh, it much much emphasis is laid on the word awafum, on, on the uh, phrase Allahu Mudafa. Some scholars have gone to interpret have ex, ex, have, have uh, chosen to interpret this as uh, um, a condition which would uh, make uh, a financial dealing either haram or halal they say interest in itself 
is not uh, forbidden. What is forbidden is a form of interest, which is adhafa mudafa, which means which multiplies rapidly and uh, mercilessly. So if that condition is lacking, then you can have ordinary normal rates, you can indulge in ordinary dealings of interest with normal acceptable rates, which is not forbidden. But other sco most scholars have completely rejected this idea and uh, they say this adafa mudafa is a phrase which only indicates to the ugliness of the ultimate uh, result of indulging in usury. He says this is what it amounts to ultimately. And uh, this is to, to highlight the ugliness of usury itself, this adafa uh, mudafa uh, is added to describe the ugliness. It is not a condition. Hazrat Khalifatul Masih Awwal has pointedly mentioned that you, uh, you, your interest, whatever you call it, has been forbidden even without this condition separately. Declaration is clear and uh, unconditional that this is haram. You, you can't, can't do that. So the only meaning of Adhafa Mudafa is to, uh, I mean, the only way we should treat the word, the phrase Adhafa Mudafa is to accept it as an, a further attempt to uh, magnify the evil of uh, usury. Hazrat Mali Sarvasha Sahib has mentioned that, in fact, all usury ultimately ends up in adafa mudafa, whether the terms are soft or hard. Because most people who are compelled to borrow money are in a poor uh, financial uh, state of, uh, have a poor st financial standing. And uh, most cannot pay uh, you, you, uh, the, the borrowed money uh, on interest terms in time. So the time lapses and the, the money goes on increasing until the capital grows also in volume. And even if the terms are very soft, even if it's 2-3% like some international loans are, ultimately the capital increases to a degree that this 2 or 3% practically amounts to 20-25% to the as relation to as, as uh, in comparison to the original uh, sum which was uh, loaned out so it's very very wise observation on the part of hazrat mali sarvasha sahib who was a very deep sound religious scholar but who didn't have much knowledge of subjects other than religious like economy etc but uh, he was exceptionally intelligent and uh, his tafsir, tafsir is salvary, uh, should be rated very high among all the tafsir. And uh, I recommend those who can have access to tafsir is salvary to read it. So this point was raised by Hazrat Mawli Sarvisha Sahib. Now this point, the point which has been raised by Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasiyabwal is obviously uh, supported by many verses which have very strong condemnation of uh, interest or usury and uh, do not mention any condition attached to that. For instance, Alladina Yakuluna Reba La Yakumuna Illa Kama Yukumul Ladi Yatahabato Hushaitano Minal Mas that uh, those who devour interest do not rise except as rises one whom Satan has smitten with insanity. That is because, they say, trade also is like interest. So those who believe that uh, trade also is a means of increasing one's money, so 
loaning out your capital to someone else should uh, justify the same increase, expected increase. So it is type of trade, no more. The Holy Quran very strongly rejects this idea and rejects the very institution of uh, interest, which unfortunately is uh, getting more and more, um, I think, which I should say, which unfortunately is accepted by all the Muslim states so far as, I'm, as much as I know and which has gone deep into the financial dealings of all Muslim societies and unfortunately also Ahmadis are not treating it anymore with such taboos as they used to treat it uh, three decades ago for instance or four decades ago. So they are Lack, becoming lax in their abhorrence of uh, borrowing money on interest, etc. And I should remind you that the Holy Quran is very severe on this thing. The Holy Quran uh, is, is very harsh in, her judge, in its judgment on those who take license in this regard and consider it to be an ordinary small thing. But uh, let me return to the, concept, the, the question of connection first, then I'll speak of these things again. Now, as far as the relationship to the previous verses, not only the verse, but the verses is concerned, I believe, I fully agree with, of course, uh, Afal, that uh, usury or the interest institution of interest is inseparably related to uh, big wars. A small skirmish or battle uh, may be considered as an exception, but the institution of war as such is related to the system of usury. If you study the history of the First World War and the Second World War, you will be pained to learn that uh, the prolongation of both these wars was only possible because of borrowing of money at high interest rates, both internally by the states involved in, in belligerency or externally from other powerful wealthy sources. This is why bonds are issued so extensively, defense bond, this and that on the promise that uh, the person will be paid more. And uh, also the governments borrow heavily from uh, um, rich financial houses, banks, etc., from outside and from other states, etc., etc. The, the beneficiaries of wars are always capitalists. The wealthy people in the society, as well as those who have uh, financial racketeering, international financial racketeering. And in both these wars, those who benefited most were the Jews because they controlled the sources of money, the, the, the uh, sources of capital. And both these wars were turned to their advantage to such degree that uh, it leaves one to imagine that uh, perhaps wars are desirable for the Jews. If there are no wars, perhaps they would be encouraged to plan and conspire to have wars because a situation of peace is far less advantageous to them than a situation of war. Look at the question of Israel itself. Had there been no Second World War, there would, not have, would have been no Israel. The British government was heavily indebted to uh, uh, Rothschild bank, Jewish Bank for borrowing money for their war efforts and also to other Jewish uh, controlled financial, uh, financial houses. So that is why the interest, uh, the, the system of interest, uh, institution of interest and banking are 
coupled with the dangers of wars, if not so initially, at least they are coupled with the dangers of wars being prolonged beyond uh, normal expectancies. So the Holy Quran is discussing war, a situation, a war of jang e And uh, suddenly to speak of usury is not irrelevant. It is, uh, you know, they're deeply connected subjects. The second link is with the last verse of the previous ruku, which uh, stands as a bridge between the previous subject and the subject to come. But I remind you that this entire ruku should be treated as uh, something in parenthesis, which is related, but uh, uh, which also stands as a sort of uh, interlude between two, sub two subjects. And the question of war will be discussed again. And the same subject will be taken, taken up again in general. So this interlude also justi is justified through relationship between what has been said before and what is yet to come after this ruku will be finished. Now the bridge which I mentioned was the verse Lillahi maafi samawati wa maafi lardu yaghfiru li man yashao wa yu'adhibu man yashao wallahu ghafurur rahim It speaks of God's uh, uh, right prerogative authority to forgive whomsoever he pleases uh, or to punish whomsoever he pleases. This is the ordinary meaning and so much has been said about it in, uh, and, and, and discussed in most commentaries. But uh, I have not read anywhere that this verse in fact is the opening door to the second ruku. In the second ruku, which we have just read, started reading, everything is explained. Who are the people whom God forgives? Who are the people whom God punishes? The reasons why he forgives. The reasons why he punishes. So this is a very important subject which has to, had to be explained. So although as such it can be taken in parenthesis, but it has its own justified place here. So now you, I'll, I'll, let's turn to the question of usury. The usury is the worst type of exploitation of the helpless people, the poor, the innocent. And usury is uh, a, a, a social crime because somebody who is downtrodden and fallen and stands in need of financial help for his very survival. He would not go to ask asking for money for any lender towards to, to any lender <coughs> if he was financially sound. Only occasionally it uh, happens that a financially sound person or party would uh, uh, like to borrow money. They are, these things are for um, saving um, income tax, etc. These measures are taken even by uh, financially strong houses in business. But uh, for the time being, that is not what I want to discuss. What I want to discuss is that in ordinary practice, most of the common people, most of the middle class people who are forced to borrow money from banks or from other part private sources, they are always the losers. They are losers in so many ways, more, much more than one way. Even at the time of wars, you have just heard that the governments uh, issue bonds on the promises that they would increase and double up in four or five years and so on. In reality, what happens is that a big fraud is played on the public of such governments by the governments themselves by the time the money doubles up, the value of the money 
decreases by many factors. So in five years' time, a war situation, <coughs> if somebody has bought uh, bonds, saving bonds, etc., and is expecting, hopefully, of course, that if the government stayed in power and the country didn't fall altogether, he would get his money doubled up. By that time, is the value of the money could be reduced to even one hundredth of the value uh, compared to the time when he loaned it to the government. So it is a big fraud. Exploitation of the poor and the innocent and the unknowing. In private affairs also, we know that uh, there is a system of private lending and uh, borrowing even in such advanced countries as England. And uh, some uh, organizations investigated into the reasons why it happened and uh, where it leads to. And the disc their report is so horrifying. They say that even in a country like England, which is considered to be so advanced and civilized, usury worse than the usury which you have, uh, you know, uh, is practiced by Pathans, money lenders in, in Pakistan and India, is being uh, operated here in England. Sometimes uh, some financial houses crop up and, and, and let the word pass around that we can give you immediately without any um, uh, you know, legal papers and preparations, etc., at 25% per three months. And uh, if a small, when you need a small sum of money, for instance, 100 pounds, 200 pounds immediately, you say, all right, I'll pay 125 pounds, okay, I can use it. These are the people who fall victims to such uh, fraudulent financial houses. And the practice is so large and so heinous that such people mostly end up heavily, heavily under debt to these organizations and they can never wriggle out of this because of the legal implications of the, of the agreements. So the same thing is happening in Pakistan, in India, in the third world countries and in Sindh, for instance, in the poorest area of Pakistan, which is the Thar, where uh, scheduled caste Hindus are uh, um, you know, mostly it's populated by scheduled caste India, uh, Hindus. There, there are also banyas of uh, higher class of Hindus who are money lenders. When through the work of Vakf e I visited that area for the first time, I was horrified to discover that the entire land of the populace was uh, 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 in fact uh, had become practically the property of the money lenders. It had been legally written, written down that no, uh, uh, no proprietor of the right, no, not legally written down, virtually it is, but legally the previous uh, owners of the land still remain legally the owner. So I was uh, a bit uh, intrigued about this situation. I said, why don't the Hindus just take over the land and finish with this nonsense? Then I discovered that if they do it, this usury system of usury, usury the chain of usury will break. Because then they, these poor people they have nothing to do, then they'll migrate elsewhere to other parts of Pakistan and uh, earn their livelihood through labor. Now the land still remains in their name. So they're tied down to the same area. What happens is whatever they produce is completely appropriated by the money lenders because there is far more they still owe them than the entire land produce of one year or even many years. So they take it wholesale completely 
and write down in their khatas, bahis, etc., that this much has been paid back. And then they say, now how much you need for the next for the next year to live? So they borrow on new terms, part of the produce of their own land, and it is lent out to them, and uh, the in the servicing of their debt goes on increasing as well as the debt itself to such uh, figures as it's impossible, mind-boggling figures. Some people owe to the lenders 20, 50 times the value of their land. So they are enslaved bondage men of these uh, land money lenders. So if you are so cruel, so heartless, how could you expect forgiveness of Allah? Why should Allah forgive you when you treat his servants so inhumanely, so uh, cruelly, and so mercilessly? So the verse, يَغْفِرُوا man yashao and يَوَزِبُوا man yashao is deeply related to what is being fo- what is fo- what follows. Now you read again a few verses and then you will understand the same subject is being built up. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ After a few verses, the same subject is further developed and then comes this verse. أَلَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضُّرَّاءِ وَالْقَاذِمِينَ الْغَيْذَ وَالْآفِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُوسِنِينَ Those, in fact, deserve forgiveness of Allah who spend in prosperity as well as in adversity. Instead of exploiting others' adversity, they, while they themselves are in adversity, spend in the cause of helping others, help in, in the cause of goodness and in the cause of Allah, to help the poor, to mitigate their misery, instead of exploiting them. So this is the connection and those who forgive and uh, overlook the faults of others, even if somebody is incapable of paying back the money he had borrowed from from them, they they say, all right, I forgive, I don't take it, I don't demand anything. Such are the people who uh, deserve Allah's forgiveness. So the previous question raised about why should Allah forgive anybody arbitrarily without any reason is well answered here in the following verses and the connection is becomes very obvious as you read through the ruku. The second verse وَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ has also been the subject of discussion on one important single point. Some scholars say that the meaning is avoid or save yourself from the fire which has been prepared for the um, non-believers. So some say that it is a very, according to one scholar, I'll explain, I'll tell you who. Perhaps it is Imam Abu Hanifa who says this is the most uh, alarming verse as far as the Muslims are concerned because this is one place where the Muslims are addressed and they are told that you should fear the fire which is prepared for non believers. So you will not be exempted from that fire, that type of hell which is prepared specially for the non-believers. I have uh, misplaced it somewhere. Do you remember where? Huh? Imam Hanifa, yeah, I guess, quite right. 
Yes, it is Imam Abu Hanifa who has pointed out that this is this verse should not be taken lightly because it's one place in the Holy Quran where the Muslims are addressed and as such they are threatened with the hellfire which is prepared for the non-believers. So this has become the subject of discussion why it is done so. But before we uh, uh, go further into this aspect, let me point out that the word annar, according to the Arabic, does not only mean hellfire, it also means war. And elsewhere in the Holy Quran, war has been promised to those who do not abstain from indulging in usury and interest systems. So here annar should be translated as war. The prior meaning should be war because the Holy Quran bears it out elsewhere that the punishment for those who do not abstain from indulging in usury are promised by God that they will suffer uh, from devastating wars. So we have already seen the connection between usury and wars and uh, the Holy Quran also mentions that connection. So in this context, the meaning should be وَاتَّقُنْ نَارَ الَّتِي وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ O Muslims, you know the implications of all this. Save yourself at least from the wars which are prepared for uh, the non-believers for their indulgence in such crimes. In fact, the capitalist system as such is uh, uh, potent with, uh, uh, is potentially capable of producing wars. And the Holy Quran says it will produce wars. So no capitalist system in the world can remain much longer in peace. The capitalistic philosophy itself generates wars. And uh, as such, the Muslims are warned that we have told you of the uh, inherent dangers of this uh, financial folly of indulging in interest. Still, if you do not abstain from it, you will get involved in such wars which were initially prepared for the non-believers, not for you. And uh, this is what has happened during the world, uh, the Gulf crisis, in fact. As I once suggested, if the Muslims, rich Muslims, oil-rich Muslim states had not indulged in um, the, the bank interest uh, interests uh, with, to, to, to be used for their own personal gains, there could not have been any Gulf War at all because the money they get in interest, if they had spent in good cause on poorer brother Muslims and uh, Arabs at least, if not other Muslims, this could have created such deep satisfaction and it could have fulfilled the more than fundamental requirements of the whole area in such a manner as no ill will could prevail and could uh, survive in this atmosphere. So I'm quite certain that uh, if the Muslims had taken, uh, have taken the cue from the Holy Quran in the Gulf area and around, this unfortunate war could never have occurred. That is why I advise them, that not only Muslims, the third world countries, that those who are oil rich, they must immediately decide that they will not use their interest on uh, their, their, cap their, their wealth for uh, purposes other than helping the poor. So if they do this and give zakat from their uh, um, hoardings, the, the fate of the entire world can be changed because uh, this is the financial boost that the third world so much needs. And if you calculate, calculate the wealth and the outcome of uh, 
interest on their hoarded money and uh, zakat on two and a half percent, you'll be surprised how much money becomes immediately available for uh, spending on the good cause. So, Vattakun Naralati here means primarily to save yourself from uh, the, the horrors of a war which initially is uh, designed for non-believers who indulge in the system of usury and capitalism, etc. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ And uh, obey Allah and His Messenger, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that you are shown mercy. So this is the same theme which was uh, um, opened up by the leading verse of the last, last, last ruku. The last verse of the last ruku becomes the leading verse of this ruku, I mean, and becomes a bridge between the subjects previously discussed and the subjects being discussed here now. Mufradat Imam Raghib, for instance, also mentions uh, a nar ul harbo. Nar is used also to indicate wars. Now I'm just uh, scanning through the opinions of other classical commentators. If anything is worth worthy of mention, I'll mention it to you. As Muslim also has mentioned this, that here Annar means war. There's nothing worthy of mention is left out, so I'll turn to the next verse. Wasareu ila maqfiratin, wasareu ila maqfiratin mir rabbikum wa jannatin arduha samawat wal ard, oiddat lil muttaqeen, and hasten towards forgiveness of your Lord and to the paradise Arduha Samawat Walard whose span or expense is uh, equal to the span and expense of the whole universe, the heaven and the earth. Oiddat Lil Muttaqeen, this has been prepared for those who fear Allah. So in fact, these two verses stand in, in contrast to each other. There a hell was mentioned or war was mentioned, O Iddat Lil Kafirin, for the non-believers. Here it is O Iddat for Muttaqeen, not uh, just believers, but those who fear Allah, they will have in, uh, uh, this, this uh, heaven described here. Personally, I believe that uh, this should apply both to the uh, heaven which is promised after this life, in the next life to come, and also to a sort of heaven which has been promised here on this earth. My reason is that Anar has been translated, acceptably translated, in two ways. One meaning of Anar is applicable to this world here, and the other meaning of Anar is applicable to the world, the second next world. So, also this verse, which stands in contrast to this, should have both these two applications. 
one application for this world as against the nar of war and the second application for the next world to come in the sense of the heaven as we understand which is promised to us in the life to come so in the in the first sense of the word sare ila maghfirat mir rabbikum wa jannatin arduha samawat wal ardu iddat lil muttaqin means if you fear allah if you abstain from interest and usury etc then we promise that you will be able to create a heaven here on earth which will not only be a heaven for worldly things but it will create an atmosphere where people will become become godly god fearing and uh, this would be a heaven both for concerning the matters of this world and the concerning the matters of religion as well so a a climate which is uh, generated from capitalistic system is uh, not promotive to the type of heaven which is visualized in the holy quran not only for the next world but for the world here in on this earth the heaven which has been mentioned in connection with adam's first heaven that heaven has been described as a place on earth where the basic needs of man are guaranteed la tazma fiha wala tujwa fiha wala tujwa fiha wala alla tujwa fiha wala tara wala tazma fiha wala tadha a place where you have neither hunger nor thirst nor uh, living open in the sky without a shelter or uh, a place where you do you are not deprived of your basic rights to clothing and uh, a shelter over your head this is the heaven described in uh, uh, relation to the first heaven created by the first prophet of god so this heaven also applies to this world but this is a far more advanced heaven then the heaven visualized in relation to the time of adam this heaven is in relation to the sharia of hazrat muhammad mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the difference between the two descriptions is like describing an uh, a crude rudimentary form of living to a highly organized and civilized and advanced living with full amenities so the holy quran here is pointing out that if you abstain from usury and destroy the capitalistic philosophy and system and uh, stick to the values of the quran as far as the economic system uh, is concerned we promise you that the whole mankind will be ushered into a new era where the life here on earth would become heavenly it would be a heaven which would extend there all the spheres of human activity the meaning of as samawat wal ard in this relation would be which would cover all their activities spiritual religious material social etc etc so this should be the first meaning of this verse سارے ولا مغفرۃ من ربکم و جنت نردھا سماوات والارض عدت للمتقین as i have already explained in context with the previous verse it means for the creation of economic social heaven here on earth based on islamic principles of absolute justice and fair play and secondly this verse applies to the heaven to come in the world to come in the life to come in that context the word nar would also be translated as uh, hell fire so when we translate it as war it would do not do not mean that we obviate the translation of of hell both apply at the same time simultaneously so nar nar is promised to the muslims who do not abstain from cooperating with the 
financial systems of the world which play havoc with the peace of human beings and uh, which exploit the the poor and create ugly situations of artificial famines hunger and misery etc etc so anybody who helps and promotes such systems cruel systems is warned that uh, you may suffer also the punishment which essentially and originally is prepared for the non believers and some other interesting points about this uh, the, 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 these verses this verse are discussed uh, by different scholars first of all why sareu ila maghfirat mir rabbikum why hasten towards this elsewhere this is not mentioned in connection with other ordinary human conduct that why should you hasten of course uh, in in connection with man's relationship to god the same type of phrase is employed for instance firru ilallah run towards god and she seek his shelter and his nearness but in ordinary life situation this were, this expression has not been used elsewhere except here it says sareu ila maghfirat mir rabbikum wa jannatin arduha samawat wal ard hasten towards forgiveness from allah and that uh, heaven which has expands uh, extending as big as uh, which has as large an expanse as the universe itself sare u perhaps is mentioned because a situation where the needs of the poor is uh, ignored where they are abandoned without anybody showing mercy to them where instead of trying to improve their lot they are further exploited and uh, made further miserable until the very life becomes a misery a prolonged misery for them this is something which uh, incurs allah's wrath where allah will not wait for you to die and come to him before he punishes you uh, in total as a whole so the war punishment here will take place here on this earth and also other sorts of punishments the life of the rich would also <coughs> be made miserable somehow and restless and without peace so the whole society would suffer if you do not hasten to redress your own follies and uh, continue to indulge in such financial systems where the poor are continuously being robbed of their due rights the other point of discussion has been ardu has samawat wal ard some people say ard means the breadth and uh, length is not mentioned so they take it too literally they say this means that the breadth of the heaven is as much as uh, the entire universe the the tawalat or the length is not mentioned because the universe is shorter in that direction so there are two planes breadth and length so they say only length breadth is mentioned because the jannah is much longer although equal in in breadth to this universe the others of course take a different view they say no ard also means the size the general uh, expands of uh, something it's not necessarily the the breadth so it covers both uh, the, the 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 length and the breadth simultaneously there is a third view uh, that ard also means value 
and that also is applicable and it's a very uh, interesting um, addition to the connotations of the word Ard. In this context, it would mean that hasten to the heaven which in value is as great as the whole universe. So why to have a very disadvantageous bargain for the sake of uh, the interest money, which is small and uh, meaningless as compared to the value of the whole universe, you are uh, jeopardizing your, your, your gains, your, your rewards to a degree where it would be just madness for you to continue indulging in this crime. So the, the Holy Quran says the value of Allah's maghfirat, his forgiveness, and the value of the Jannah which he has in store for you is as big as the whole universe. So that is one meaning. Others have raised the question of taking literally the words uh, expense. Those who agree, the who believe that both breadth and length are mentioned here, the entire size is mentioned, they wonder if this is Jannah, where the hell would be? Because all the space is covered by Jannah and there is no space left for hell to survive anywhere. So they in fact think in the ordinary three, four dimensional terms and they don't know that there are more dimensions to existence, to the forms of existence. Already the mathematicians have worked out 14 or more dimensions in mathematical, hypothetical possibilities. The three or four dimensions known to us are not all the dimensions to existence. There are other possibilities. And you will be fascinated to learn that this is exactly what the, what the answer was. Uh, this, this is exactly what Ahazur Sallallahu pointed out when he was confronted by such a question. It is reported that the representative of Hirqal, Kaiser, was at Medina when perhaps close to that period this verse was revealed. So he was a bit stupefied by this because he was taking it literally in the ordinary dimensions. So he said, point, uh, pointing to this verse, he asked Nazareth I have heard that you invite people to a heaven which is prepared for the God-fearing people whose expanse is equal to the entire universe. My question is, where the hell would be if the heaven covers the entire area, entire space. The answer was, Subhanallah, Allah is free from all uh, defects. When there is day, where does the night go? The same space. <laughs> so there is day, there is night. You know, he pointed out to different possibilities. He didn't say exactly that uh, there are dimensions and other possibilities, uh, I mean, in the form of mathematical possibilities. But what he pointed out was, it was deeper than just the question of dimension. What he said was that hell is not something substantial which occupies a place and displaces other similar things. Hell is the, uh, is the, co uh, the concept of hell, according to what Rasulullah has instructed us, has instructed us, is like a negative value. 
when there is light, there is no darkness. What is darkness? It is absence of light. It is not something uh, which occupies something on its own merit and its own right. So what he pointed out was that hell is the possession of, now heaven is the possession of Allah's uh, favors, his kindness, his blessings. To see with the light of Allah is heaven. When this is missing, then in the same space hell is created for you. You don't require a different space. So a very delicate and sublime meaning of heaven and earth, earth has been pointed out by Ahadullah sallallahu alayhi wa And uh, still one, is, one wonders why the medieval Muslim scholars and even scholars of today consider heaven and hell to be more corporal in their nature than ethereal and uh, spiritual. So this means that all the goodness, the goodness is all that counts. And lack of goodness is what creates hell. And lack of goodness is not a substantial value in itself. Like the darkness is just the lack of light. So they don't require different spaces. If you shut your eyes in the same space, you will lack, uh, you will break touch with light and you will be in darkness. You open your eyes and in the same space you get your, 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 uh, your day or heaven as it has been described here. So people would live in the same outward space, yet their experiences would be different. This is the message. <coughs> People living in covering the souls or whatever forms they are uh, in afterlife, they would cover the same space, so to say. But their experience will be so different that one soul would experience hell and the other would be experience, experiencing heaven. So outward dimensions do not matter, do not count and are not related. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالْضَرَّاءِ وَالْكَازِمِينَ الْغَيْزَ وَالْآفِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُوسِنِينَ This is the description of those people who would earn heaven. But the door to heaven is through maghfirah. The previous verse should be understood in this context that uh, Maghfira is mentioned first and uh, Al Jannah is mentioned immediately afterwards. So Maghfira is mentioned uh, by, uh, in the form of a doorway to Jannah. That also is, uh, implies that no one can ever enter Jannah or heaven on his own right, on the merit of his own good deeds. Maghfira will be needed to uh, ha have him shorn of his uh, um, sins and their bad effects. So until he is purified by God with his uh, forgiveness, nobody can enter heaven. And who are those people? who would earn forgiveness. This is what is being discussed here. It is also related to the verse which I have pointed out repeatedly, the last verse of the last ruku, second, the, the previous ruku. Alladheena yunfiquna fi sarrai wa darrai whose conduct is exactly opposite to the materialistic, the conduct of materialistic people. Those who confirm to the capitalistic views. Now this is very important. It mentions that those people who spend 
not only in prosperity but also in adversity. Now, if you have a borrowing habit, if you have a style of life where you can't live within your means, how can you spend in adversity? So this is the greatest compliment that could be given to the Muslims of their uprightness, of their uh, being content with whatever God has provided them. And to live within means such as the people who would neither beg from others nor borrow money. Otherwise it's impossible. The situation cannot be conceived. So then if a society is created of such upright, God-fearing people, the system of usury and interest would automatically collapse. Nobody would go to the lending houses because such poor people would be in search of places where they could be sp they could spend in the cause for the sake of others rather than to the lending houses to borrow money or to to to, to such um, societies who give money i mean give money by way of arms and distribute it to the poor etc so they won't need any such things any help either temporary or permanent so this is very important. This is why I once uh, uh, issued a sermon on the question of Kanath. Ahmadis must pay attention to, the, to this Kanath. Lack of Kanath compels them, not only sometimes to beg, but also to borrow, uh, even on interest. And they say, we don't have this, we don't have that, we need for this and we need for that. So. Are we not justified now to be considered helpless, compelled to get to borrow money on interest? So sometimes I can't argue with them, I pity them, but I know this is wrong. This is wrong, but justified only because, first of all, they have to rectify their style of life. And they don't come to me for such sermons. They come for a quick answer, this or that. But here is the verse of the Holy Quran which throws ample light on the whole philosophy of uh, the, the financial relationship. So if the Muslims, the Holy Quran tells us, are upright people, if they learn to live in adversity, not only that, despite adversity, if they desire to spend on others and help others, this would be the first brick for the creation of heaven on earth. Otherwise, no heaven on earth can be built. And this is exactly what happened at the time of the holy founder of Islam. The poorest people of the society, the poorest section of the society, wanted to spend rather than to beg. They were so upright that some would even face death instead of begging to, to remove their hunger, to, to appease their hunger. So, once a party from among them approached the holy founder of Islam وسلم, and uh, expressed their deep dissatisfaction, not at their poverty, but at their being unable to spend in the cause of Allah. They said, we are so poor that when we see other healthier sections, more fortunate sections of the society to spend on good cause, to respond to your calls of, of spending in the cause of Allah, we, we go through hell, suffering, deep suffering within us. We can't do it. So, they, uh, advise, they took advice from our Salam, but what we know is this, that they started going out to the uh, woodlands and cut wood bring that back to the uh, township and uh, whatever proceeds they received from the uh, from selling of such wood they would give as alms to the other poor people while perhaps they were the poorest in the society not necessarily alms the, there were national requirements national needs the enemy could borrow money on uh, on, on 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 interest and um, could amass enough capital 
for wars. The Muslims could not. So all the source of the income was on its, on was based on the um, quality of the society. If the society was of such high quality as being poor, it could spend on good cause. Only then Islam could survive. And this is exactly what Ahazar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did produce on earth. So these poor people would do hard labor, not for the sake of improving their lot on earth, for getting more amenities, but for to, to, what to be able to spend in the cause of Allah. If you remember the history of Tahrik e Jadid, you will also recall to mind that there hundreds of such wonderful uh, uh, episodes developed and such things happened. Has Muslim Maud has many a time mentioned these things, fascinating experiences of poor people who uh, would uh, add to their source of income by putting in hard extra labor like people here do extra work uh, and 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 get extra time payment so they did it only for the sake of being able to participate in tehreek e jadid so this is the life force of jamaat ahmadiyya this character and we cannot build a heaven on earth here either for ourselves or even dream of building it for the whole world unless we promote these basic qualities of life. So this verse is highly important and very uh, strongly bonded and connected with the whole subject. A society like this will prevent wars. If countries, poor countries, are made up of such stuff as I am describing, as the Holy Quran has described, then they would never turn to international financial houses, or big powers like America, Russia, etc., for borrowing money on, on heavy interest, etc., and uh, go completely under them and get uh, uh, totally enslaved by their policies. They'll be free, upright people. They will learn how to live on roots if they can't get crops bearing uh, um, wheat or rice, etc. In Africa, for instance, they have enough roots to live by. But basically, first, the character is necessary for building such a society and such situation. Wars would become obsolete, meaningless. This uh, imperialism will fall on its own uh, uh, superstructure. It will collapse because there will be nobody else to rule because poor people are ruled by their bad habits and uh, their defective attitude to life by their greed by by their uh, by their, their uh, insensitive sensitivities to other friends or relatives and and and, and the countrymen etc so in the end i'll remind you that in qadian hazrat muslim maud tried to build such a society and once uh, uh, somebody uh, who came perhaps uh, as representative of Gandhi or Nehru, I think it was Gandhi, who asked him about the liberation of India and pointed out, it was a lady, I think, she pointed out that when you do not believe in nonviolence or violence, how would you get India liberated? The answer was, the essence of the answer was, that I believe in the liberation of man first. If man is liberated from his, the bondage of his own sins and follies and greeds and avarices and, and this selfishness, etc., such a liberated people can never be ruled by outsiders. They are the true free people. And he said, look go, uh, at Kadyan, go around the streets and see for yourself you won't find any police presence. You won't find the presence of, of, of government agencies in any form except nominally, only to, 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 be, to be formally there. Why? Because we are a liberated people. 
He said, you are talking about in, in India 40 crores, 400 million. Give me 200 million Ahmadis of this character. And the British will be forced to abandon India and go back to their homes. So this is the message of this verse. They deserve Allah's forgiveness and that forgiveness would be a doorway to heaven. Not only in the hereafter but here on this in this world. And they uh, control their angers. They are not ridden by their angers. They ride their angers and control them. And they overlook the, the follies and uh, uh, faults of their fellow human beings. Wallahu yuhibbul mosinin. And it's, it's not just a question of forgiveness. Allah loves such people who show kindness to others and who do good deeds. So. Unless I've discovered something else which might have been mentioned, uh, omitted. I will, from from next, we will turn to the other verses.